Israel is facing more political turmoil as its national elections Tuesday remain too close to call, with 92 percent of the vote counted. A Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party and ex-military chief Benny Gantz's Blue and White party appear to be nearly tied, with about 32 seats in the Knesset. Uh, Netanyahu was seeking a record fifth term as prime minister, but his political future is now in question. Uh, the election was called after Netanyahu failed to build a coalition government following an election in April. It also came as Netanyahu is facing possible indictments over multiple corruption cases. Both Netanyahu and Gantz had run on platforms vowing to take harsh measures targeting Palestinians. Netanyahu promised to annex nearly a third of the occupied West Bank if he won, in violation of international law. Earlier this year, Gantz bragged in a campaign ad he'd bombed Gaza back to the Stone Ages, and he vowed to, quote, pound Gaza again. As chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces, Gantz oversaw Israel's assaults on Gaza in 2012 and 2014. He's currently facing Facing a war crimes lawsuit in a Dutch court filed by a Dutch Palestinian woman who lost six relatives in Israel's 2014 assault on Gaza. On Tuesday night, Gantz said he had fulfilled his mission by preventing Netanyahu's outright re election. I am happy and very excited to be here tonight. We will, of course, await the actual results. But as it seems, we fulfilled our mission. And just as important, we fulfilled it our way. One can say that according to the results as they appear to be, Netanyahu did not succeed in his mission. Meanwhile, on Tuesday night, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu did not claim victory or concede defeat in a, in a speech to his supporters. Israel needs a strong government stable government, Zionist government, a government that is committed to Israel as a national state for the Jewish people. There can't be a government that is being supported by Arab parties, which are anti-Zionist. The close election could result in the far-right former defense minister, Viktor Lieberman, becoming the kingmaker, as both Gantz and Lieberman attempt to form a coalition government, as both Gantz and Netanyahu attempt to form a coalition government. We go now to Jerusalem, where we're joined by the Palestinian attorney, Diana Butu. She's a former advisor to Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, serves as policy advisor of al-Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Her latest piece for The Nation is headlined, The Israeli Election or a referendum on who can treat Palestinians most harshly. Diana Butu, welcome to Democracy Now! Your take on the elections so far? Well, so far, it's not clear. It's not clear who will be the ultimate victor. I can tell you who will be the ultimate loser, and that's the Palestinian people. This is because both uh, Netanyahu and Gantz have come out very strongly against Palestinians. N this was not, for example, a referendum on the more than 50-year military occupation, but instead it was a campaign that was filled with racist statements on the part of Netanyahu, uh, urging people to vote because the Arabs were out voting out out in large numbers, um, and with with Gantz also saying that he was intending to crush Gaza. So the we don't know yet who who the victor will be, but we certainly do know who the loser will be, and that will be those who don't want to see apartheid, um, those who don't want to see a continuation of the occupation, and those uh, who do want to see freedom. And, and uh, Dana Butsu, you've mentioned, uh, for instance, that there was no discussion in this campaign of the uh, Jewish nation state law that was passed the last year and which really uh, caused deeply into question any Israeli claims to being a democratic state. Could you talk about that? Yes, certainly. In fact, none of the party platforms, with the exception of the one uh, anti-Zionist the anti-Zionist group called the Joint List, none of them even mentioned words like occupation or had a platform when it came to Palestinian freedom or even mentioned the words e the word equality. Instead, uh, the, all of the political parties across the spectrum, with the, with the exception of the Joint List, really uh, came out and said that this needs to be a Jewish state. They needs to, to pervert. Per 
preserve the idea of a Jewish uh, majority and Jewish superiority. And uh, none of them really had anything to say um, about Palestinian freedom. So, in some total, when we were looking at this election as a Palestinian who is a citizen of Israel, this really was uh, an election in, in U.S. terms of between Trump versus Trump, with no real difference between the candidates and certainly no difference between the, the political parties and platforms. And what about the joint list? Did it, gr uh, did it grow uh, in numbers uh, based on the results so far? Yes. Uh, what we did see was that they, the joint list ran a very strong campaign, a campaign that was aimed at stopping the, um, the extreme right-wing fascist party, a party that, has, uh, that is labeled as a terrorist party in the, in the United States. Um, the attempt was to try to get as many people out to vote so that this party would be stopped, and indeed they did succeed in that. Not only succeeded, but they've increased their numbers to yet another, uh, another seat. What was very interesting in their campaign campaign was that the campaign is not just a campaign that targets uh, Arab voters. It's a campaign that targets the Jewish-Israeli left and says to the Jewish-Israeli left, if you really believe in an end to the occupation, if you really believe in equality, ours is the only party that has that platform. And we did see that they managed to secure votes from, uh, from Jewish-Israeli voters as well, because of the fact that there is really no alternative. There, the sh all of the other parties were, uh, were competing over how harsh they could be against Palestinians, not in terms of what vision they have for freedom or equality. I'd like to turn to the Democratic Union Knesset candidate Stav Shafir. She was first elected to the Knesset as a member of the Labour Party in 2013, becoming the youngest woman lawmaker in Israeli history. She told CNN Tuesday the majority of Israelis support a two-state solution. This is what she said. Most Israeli citizens are not like Netanyahu. We have, even after 40 years of mostly right-wing governments, we have 65% um, of Israelis who support the two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians. That's the most safe solution. It's the most moral uh, solution that we all support. But Netanyahu at the moment, regardless of uh, what he actually believes and, and of what our security system supports, um, the entire Israeli security system um, is pro-two-state solution and a clear border between us and the Palestinians. Netanyahu at the moment um, will do everything that he can in order to establish, to build a government and escape trial, to pass legislation that will prevent um, the justice system and prevent parliament um, from putting him in trial and from getting into prison let, let because of his corruption cases. Diana Butu, your response and the significance of Stav Shafir. It's it's, it's very interesting that she says this, given that her own party platform didn't mention ending the occupation, didn't at all talk about the two-state solution. And she was aligned with Ehud Barak, who's also a member of her uh, political party. This is the former Israeli prime minister who propagated the, the false claim that there was no Palestinian peace partner and who himself was the person who was, was responsible for killing uh, 13 Palestinian citizens of Israel in October of 2000, when the Second Intifada started. So it's wonderful that she has this outlook at this point in time when the election is done, but it would have been obviously much better for her to have had this, uh, this outcome, uh, this vision from the beginning, articulated that vision in the beginning, and been pushing for Netanyahu and, and uh, other parties to actually end the occupation rather than continuing to perpetuate it. And I want to ask you about Netanyahu's pledge earlier this month to annex a third of the West Bank if re-elected. Despite the widespread condemnation his proposal received, his main political rival, Benny Gantz, offered no criticism, instead claimed Netanyahu took the idea from him. Gantz's Blue and White Coalition said the Jordan Valley is, quote, a part of Israel forever. Netanyahu drafted a plan to cede the Jordan Valley in 2014. We're happy Netanyahu has come around to adopt the Blue and White plan to recognize the Jordan Valley, he said. This is Netanyahu announcing his pledge to annex the third of the West Bank last week. Today I'm announcing my intention to apply with the formation of the next government, Israeli sovereignty, on the Jordan Valley and Northern Dead Sea. Anna Butu, what would this mean? And does it matter if either Gantz or Netanyahu is prime minister, given each is claiming it's the, uh, his own idea? 
You know, the fascinating thing is that it's been condemned by the entire world, but it's been applauded inside Israel. So it shows you exactly where the Israeli public lies. When you see uh, Netanyahu bragging about this plan and other parties also coming forward and bragging about it, and the so-called center, uh, centrist Gantz coming forward and not just bragging about it, but claiming that it's his own, you can see exactly where the thinking lies inside Israel, that they believe that they are above the law, they believe that, that the Palestinians are beneath the law, and that they can do whatever they want. And this is why it is vitally important for us to keep our eyes on the fact that um, whether it is Gantz that's going to be in office or Netanyahu that's going to be in office, for Palestinians, the outcome is going to be the same. And this is also why it's very important for the BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, to be, become even stronger, because that is the only way that Israel is going to be stopped. Well, on Tuesday, uh, Israel's far-right former defense minister, Vigdor Lieberman, called for a national unity government, as you mentioned, to be formed. This is what he said. We have only one option, a national, liberal, broad government compromising Israel by Tenu, Likud, and Blue and White. Both financially and in terms of security, we are indeed in a state of crisis. Therefore, the country requires a broad government. Uh, Diana Butsu, your, your response about the uh, national unity government and what it might mean? This is something, you know, Lieberman was on the brink of extinction in terms of his political position. Um, and even now, he's only the fifth in terms of the size of the party. But because of the fact that he and the other parties have this very racist outlook, uh, he's now become somebody who is very important. So he doesn't want to see a redo of the election again, but is instead calling for a broad national unity coalition. National unity, in their terms, means anybody but Palestinians. Uh, because they want to continue to continue the uh, settlement expansion, they want to continue annexation and so on. So even though Avigdor Lieberman is really not very important, because the fact that nobody really wants to look at the at the anti-Zionist party and and their platform, they are instead pushing for uh, to have this broad coalition that will continue to build and expand settlements and continue to deny Palestinians their freedom. Arakat tweeted yesterday, quote, the fact that about 5 million Palestinians will be governed by the Israeli Knesset cannot vote in today's election to, should tell you all you need to know about Israel and the international community's normalization of its racist system. Hashtag apartheid. Hashtag settler colonialism. Again, that was a tweet from human rights attorney Nora Arakat, Diana Butu. Explain how the system yes, works. Yes, she's absolutely right. Well, the system works uh, in the which is that only those people who are citizens of the state of Israel who are over the age of 18 are allowed to vote. Now, even though uh, there, are no, there are nearly 6 million individuals who are entitled to vote, Israel's also occupying um, land, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, where, under, under the rules of occupation, these are individuals who are not entitled to vote and yet who are ruled over by Israel. And so the fact that you have this dual system in place, where Israel's in control of the lives of millions of people, and half of those people are not entitled to vote, clearly shows the level of apartheid in the system that we have in place. And that is one of settler colonialism. It's one of apartheid. And this is why I think it's very important for us to recognize that, rather than applauding somebody like Gans, who may just be Israel's prime minister, we should instead be put pushing and focusing on ending that apartheid system and making sure that uh, Palestinians finally get to live in freedom and in dignity and in, and in equality, rather than under a system of Israel's thumb. What was interesting yesterday was that as Israelis were going to the polls, the checkpoints were completely shut down, so that while, pal while Israelis had freedom of movement, Palestinians were locked in their Bantu stands in order to be able to make sure that Israel was able to vote. This is the essence of living under apartheid and a settler colonial regime. Diana Butu, we want to thank you very much for being with us, Palestinian attorney, policy advisor of al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Her latest piece for The Nation will link to. It's headlined, The Israeli Elections are a Referendum on Who Can Treat Palestinians Most Harshly. 
Previously, Diana Butu was advisor to Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. When we come back, it's day three for the GM strike. Striking workers have entered that third day on the picket line, and now GM says they are cutting off their health insurance. We'll speak with veteran labor reporter Stephen Greenhouse. Stay with us.